So uh, when I first heard about your name and your position in IDEA, I wondered what was your big background and what were what was your first experience with debate. Okay. Can you uh, go back then yeah, and tell me something about it? it? It feels almost like going back into prehistory. Um, my first debate, believe it or not, took place when I was 16. Um, I left Poland, uh, which was still under communism back then, to study in an international school in Italy. And as part of our program, we used to have um, debates and um, discussions and something that was very, very new to me because we didn't have these kind of activities when I was studying at Polish school. And my first debate was on the subject of institutional religion. Um, and I think the topic was that institutionalized religion has done more harm than good. And because of my nationality, Polish, uh, everybody assumed that um, I was Catholic, which I'm not, and uh, they, they put me in the affirmative. Um, so I had to argue that um, religion has actually done good. No, anyway, it was it was it was an interesting experience. But I I hadn't I hadn't really com competed in debates, so I'm not a competitive debater. I when I was introduced to debate uh, later in my life, I was a teacher, and I used debate as a method of education. So I used it in my classroom quite a lot. I used to teach English. Um, was always um, one of my goals when teaching English to get students speak again. You can know the grammar, you can know how to uh, read and write, but if you can't speak really then it defeats the purpose of learning the language. And uh, I found out that debate was an excellent means of making people speak. Because it has structure, you can prepare, you work in a team, um, and it's also fun. So, so I used it in my um, classroom quite a lot. Uh, when I got involved uh, in international programs, I, uh, I spent about six or seven years of my professional life training in, in debate. So I trained teachers, secondary school uh, students, primary school students, even uh, university students uh, in, uh, I think, in well over 40 countries all over the world. So I think I'm very, very privileged to have this kind of experience. So how would you say that debate influences the inner circle of the students who are practicing debate and the, let's say, wider circle of the society in general? Um, I, th I think my experience, and I can definitely speak about the inner circle more than I can speak about the outer circle, I think uh, debate is one of those activities where it doesn't sort of bring immediate results in terms of societal impact. But I think it, it yields almost immediate results uh, in terms of individual development. I've seen students who were very shy, um, young people who have never spoken publicly before in their lives or um, you know, found it as a challenge. And then through you know, even a couple of hours of exercises and you know, activities involving speaking, uh, arguing, they, they, you could see the change almost straight away. Um, how they sort of understood the concept of you know, advocating, using arguments and reasons. And how that sh initial shyness and, and I would even say a fear of speaking in public um, diminished and eventually disappeared. So, um, in terms of societal changes, I, um, as I said, it's, it's, it, it takes time. Takes, I don't want to say it takes a generation, uh, that would be very pessimistic, but you definitely um, need to wait for the results. But, you know, you've, the, the programs that we run at IDEA, uh, I don't want to say that, that, that we don't do competitions, because we do competitions. It's a great way to get young people engaged, they love competing. But we also put a lot of emphasis on public debate, uh, a debate which involves uh, local community, um, with young people and students being the sort of engine, the sort of driving force behind the organization of a debate. Uh, it, it provides an opportunity for 
not just the young people, but their parents, the teachers, the local government to meet together in a sort of friendly environment and use a structured way of addressing a controversy. Uh, whether it's local or global, uh, debate gives them this opportunity to, to just talk about things um, in a way which uh, allows everyone to express their view and opinion. Would you say there are unifying characteristics of debaters slash trainers or everyone who has ever done debate in their life? Yes, I think the most unifying characteristic is that uh, it's very difficult to stop them to talk. <laughs> they love talking. <laughs> so when you think with a debater, uh, you see that they, they love talking. Uh, I guess it's good. Um, I also think that uh, debaters are better at seeing um, issues, problems, from a variety of perspectives. I, I, there are opinionated debaters, obviously, like everyone else, but I think uh, debaters are more likely to ponder a question or an issue and say, mm, there's no easy answer, you, know, you can look at it from this side or you can look at it from that side. While people who are non-debaters tend to adopt a sort of very you know, opinionated view. Something is like this, or this is like this. Debaters are more, I think, experienced. The debaters will always kind of look at different points of view. Um, debaters always, I always also find debaters uh, more likely to disagree with me. Um, and I'm speaking from personal experience because I work in my office. Uh, 99.9% of my staff is debaters. So there's always, I almost feel like the initial response of the debater is no. <laughs> it's almost like they feel this automatic need to refute or disagree, which sometimes is good because obviously, um, yeah, it, um, you know, it, it, need, it requires the new to kind of think, like, by the second you disagreed, how do I respond to that? But sometimes I find it, uh, sometimes, are always slightly counterproductive. That the uh, sort of uh, last night was a perfect example. We uh, brought up an issue related to one of the rules of the competition, discussing it amongst the debate trainers. And I think in in the most context, in the most setting, setting this issue, uh, settling this issue, would have taken about five minutes. With that debate crowd, it took an hour. So everybody had an opinion, everybody felt a need to disagree, so it's, it, it, I think that's another um, unifying characteristic. And I would say debaters, I believe, are more tolerant, open-minded. The activity almost forces an individual to adapt different views, um, even if, you know, even if you treat a debate as a game, you know, debate tournament, they have to debate the same issue speaking from the pro and con perspective. Uh, so they they kind of naturally have a greater appreciation for a view that's different from theirs. I think they find it easier to accept that someone may disagree with them. A lot of people, I think, take personal offense in, you know, somebody has disagreed with me. They take it very personally. I think debaters not so much, because they're used to it. And, uh, when they debate in a tournament, Ten hours of debating during the day, everybody disagrees with them. So, they, you know, they kind of they are more relaxed about people saying, "Oh, I, I disagree with you." Uh, uh, and and it's it's interesting because it's also very culture specific. Uh, you know, we have uh, people here from over forty countries coming from very diverse cultural backgrounds. And we may say that we live in a global village, but you know, cultural differences still exist, and in some cultures, um, some cultures are more open to disagreement, dissent. Um, some cultures are more uh, less open to this. I, I remember, um, I um, one of my challenges when working, for example, in Asia, I worked in Central Asia as well as Southeast Asia. I've always used the example of Myanmar, and Burma, as an example. It's it's, the, it's a beautiful country beautiful, sweet people, very, very nice, very polite. And, um, and a, a lot of times the politeness uh, in Burmese culture uh, makes teaching debate very difficult because it always found it a bit of a challenge 
when training in Myanmar to get people to disagree with me because they saw this as being offensive and impolite and rude because um, you don't disagree with uh, against someone who's just arrived to your country they see this as simply being impolite and, and it takes a while to kind of change that but I think this, the other cultures where, where disagreement is just a natural uh, again I don't want to be using stereotypes <laughs> but I sort of, for example when training in the Middle East and North Africa you know Jordan Egypt uh, oh my god Iraq you 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 know you throw out the, you know, put up you, you put an issue out there everybody has a different view and opinion they argue and the the, the you know they use the, the body language which is you know like uh, so so it's exciting and it, 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 it's also a very sort of humbling experience for um, myself to be you know traveling to lots of places and meeting people and seeing seeing that debate is not necessarily something that um, people take for granted something that is part of society or should be part of a society or even a political process and, and I think one of the things that I've learned um, over the years when interacting with people from different countries and using debate as a means of um, instruction is that you know, don't uh, don't make assumptions that, you know, that, um, you know I, I uh, just give you one more example I told you that the debaters love talking, but um, one of the countries where debates, I found debate being particularly challenging uh, uh, methodology was in, in Rwanda, where um, you know, for 10 years ago they had a, a tragic uh, genocide, close to a million people were killed, and, and the government, um, unfortunately, um, following the, the, the genocide, has, has um, in, in put in place very uh, various political um, sort of repressive means of controlling the population and, and it, that spread across various aspects of life in Rwanda, including education um, in, in, in not just politics but in education there's a it, teachers, the students that I've talked to um, they've, they're very very clear that they do not like and appreciate activities which can potentially divide, um, the, and they saw debate uh, as an activity which, because you disagree and because there is an opponent, they saw this as a divisive activity, at least at the beginning. And, um, I've always been asked, you know, why is it that in the debate people can't simply agree with each other? Because Rwanda should be all about agreement and not disagreement. Because last time the Rwanda disagreed, a million people died. And so I could understand the psychology behind the fear, plus all the political aspects of it. But anyway, it's it's a it's a fascinating activity which which you know, really made made my professional personal life very very different. <laughs> when it comes to digital freedom, what is your vision of the society? Um, I see digital freedom. As, um, as a right. Um, I see internet as one of the greatest inventions of you know, humankind, really. Um, I think digital freedoms or rights should be respected um, by governments all over the world. Having said that, I think that every right comes with responsibility. That you don't have a right without having responsibilities. Responsibilities for assuring that other people have rights as well. And that your exercise of that specific right does not infringe on other people's um, rights. And I think um, it's just with every invention, you know, it can be it can be put to good use and bad use. And um, I think with internet and digital rights and freedoms, there is no simple answers. Um, that's why I'm very curious to see the debates and see to what extent um, they will be simple yes or no debates versus more sophisticated policy debates. Uh, and I hope that we're going to see more policy debates here. The young people will be uh, saying, well, digital rights, yes, but with certain restrictions, 
more research on safeguards and that these will be the subject of debate. Because I don't think, you know, I don't think anyone disagrees here that the internet is good. Nobody's here advocating that it should be banned. Or it's, it's, it's the, this, this debate is going to be very nuanced and uh, I hope that the young people here will be able to, they will be able to, they will know, I hope that they will know enough and the trainers that we have and the experts that we're bringing will inform them enough about the nuances of digital rights and freedoms for these debates to be um, really, really informed and, and interesting. There's nothing more boring than a bad debate. <laughs> <You know. laughs> so what are your expectations from the Global Youth Forum 2013 in general? Um, well, um, first of all, as, as an organizer, my expectations are that everybody will be uh, happy, safe, healthy, that, that people will have a great time. Um, that's the kind of, you know... The basic line. The basic. It's the... It's the uh, you have the, the, the hierarchy, uh, Maslow's hierarchy of, <laughs> needs. of needs, like my need is. <laughs> make sure they're healthy, make sure they're safe, and make sure that they, they're here to, to have a good time. Um, the, the second, the more sophisticated need, expectation of mine is that they will actually learn something not just about debating they will not, they will not only become better debaters um, but they will also learn um, about the digital rights and freedoms about the issue um, that they will learn uh, from each other about their differences in, in, in the approach to digital rights and freedoms in different countries in different regions uh, they will share personal stories that they will share stories from their countries, newspapers and magazines. Um, I also hope that they will um, go back home uh, energized and empowered to continue their experience with painting, not just as debaters, um, but also as volunteers, as instructors, as people who will uh, try to promote their activity in their schools and their local community. Um, and, and finally, you know, I, I, I mentioned it yesterday during the opening ceremony, I think that, you know, we're here to debate, but I also think that we're here to get to know each other as individuals. A unique opportunity, you know, you have people from over 40 countries uh, speaking, you know, I'm sure more than 40 languages, um, and, and you know, having different customs and traditions and religions and eating different foods and wearing different national costumes. This is, to me, uh, almost you know, as important as the experience of painting. And I hope that you know, there is enough uh, opportunity for, for students to, uh, to experience that. And, and also, you know, they're, they're in a beautiful country, uh, friendly, uh, rich history, rich traditions. They're in a beautiful city, and, and I hope that there will be enough time for everyone to experience the Irish hospitality, the, the food, the, the, the people, the language, the history. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, I hope